This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by Luna Lux Botanicals. Luna Lux Botanicals is an all-natural ritual bath and body company providing magical products derived from nature for your self-care rituals. Each batch product is carefully handcrafted with intention by creator Cass Hayes using only all-natural and organic ingredients. Celebrate the phases of the moon with their Moon Ritual Bath Soak Collection, or exfoliate your body with crystals in their new Crystal Sea Salt Body Scrub Collection. If you're ready to add some magic to your self-care rituals, follow them on Instagram at Luna Lux Botanicals and shop online at lunaluxbotanicals.com. That's L-U-N-A-L-U-X botanicals.com. And Witchwave listeners get 15% off when they use promo code WITCHWAVE at checkout. So go on ahead to lunaluxbotanicals.com and use code WITCHWAVE, all one word, for 15% off today. The world is filled with bewitching people, and you might be one too. Welcome to the podcast where art is magic, magic is real, and reality is stranger than dreams. I'm Pam Grossman, and this is The Witch Wave. To the witch wave. My darlings, we are in December. And as I record this, the moon is waning. And honestly, I feel as though my energy has been waning right alongside it. Of course, a lot of this is due to us reaching the end of a very challenging year and being in the thick of the darkest season, which always makes me want to hibernate. But the time of the waning moon, magically speaking, is a time when many of us might feel ourselves turning inward and being a bit more quiet and reflective, or even doing the deep work of looking at things in our lives that we may want to decrease or shed altogether. I've been engaging in some form of lunar devotion since I was very young. You hear me talking about my lady Artemis all the time, and my connection to her goes back to my preteen years. But I distinctly remember being a sophomore in high school and actively choosing to deepen my connection with the moon. I did this in a whole host of ways, from doing a multimedia assignment about lunar poetry and literature for my English class, to making a visual mixtape of my favorite moon moments in cinema. Now, this was before the age of iMovie and YouTube and supercut culture, so back then, we're talking in the 1990s, I had to splice the whole thing together using two VCRs and hit record just as the right scene in Moonstruck or E.T. or Madonna's bedtime story video appeared on screen. I also did tons of reading about moon mythology, and I wore a crescent moon choker around my neck, and I would go up on the roof of our house in Morganville, New Jersey to commune with the moon whenever I needed extra strength or just wanted the company. But it wasn't until I became an adult that I learned about how to work with the energies of the phases of the moon. 
I knew the full moon was a super powerful time of witchery, of course, and I was familiar with notions of witches gathering together to cavort in its potent light. But the full moon often gets all the glory, and there are practices and rituals that are associated with every one of its phases. When people ask me how to begin or deepen their witchcraft practice, I usually tell them to start keeping an altar and to start working with the phases of the moon. Doing so has made me feel more connected to the rhythms of nature and the body and spirit, and it reminds me that life and growth are never a straight line. There are times of expansion and times of contraction, times to shine boldly and brightly, and times to bathe in shadow. And people around the world have known this for centuries. Ancient societies organized their calendars around the moon cycles, and many, such as those in Chinese, Hindu, and Jewish communities, still do. The word moon comes from the Old English mona, meaning moon, which itself has origins that are associated with the Latin word metri, which means to measure, and mensis, which means month. And yes, the word menstruate is also linked to all of the concepts of the moon and months and measurement as well. The moon is a timekeeper. The moon is also a reminder that there are alternative ways of interfacing with life that are decoupled from the industrial, capitalist, patriarchal model, which tells us that we're supposed to be constantly shining and productive and climbing higher and always on. I'm so grateful that on this episode, I get to speak with Sarah Faith Godestiner, who is an expert in lunar magic and who speaks so beautifully about the magic and messages that the moon can offer everyone. But before we get to that, first, let's check and see what's come through on The Witch Wire. Who is it? Wishes. Kate writes, Hi, Pam. I found the witch wave earlier this year on a friend's recommendation right as I'd been going through a very sad breakup at the beginning of the pandemic, and I began listening to episodes on my daily walks. Hearing you and your guests talk about the connection between spiritual well-being and magic, the earth, our bodies, and ancient or indigenous knowledge has been so healing and hopeful for me. I've been looking up magical paths to join. I'm a teacher, which means I love a syllabus and group work, and I'm drawn to Wicca and paths that focus on a female deity— but I've been perturbed by some of the anti-trans, gender-essentialist rhetoric I've read about from some of the feminist traditions that sprung up in the mid-20th century. Do you know of any LGBT-inclusive magical paths that I could research and possibly join? You're the best. Thanks for being a light and a guide during a very dark time. Hi, Kate. Thank you so much for those lovely words, and thank you for your question. I thought it was a really good one to answer today because so often the moon and witches are associated with women and goddesses and, yes, sometimes cisgendered female bodies. But we know, first of all, that there are witches of every gender, as well as many male lunar deities from the Hindu god Chandra to the Norse god Mani to the Mesopotamian god Sin. But to your point, yes, a lot of the divine feminine-based Wicca that we're familiar with got popular in the 1970s during the second wave of feminism. 
And while I am very grateful to a lot of those witches who were seeking to elevate the status of women and femininity and course correct as a reaction to the oppressive patriarchal religions and societies in general that they were living in, some of them definitely overcorrected. For example, there's Dianic Wicca, which was popularized by Z Budapest, and it was and still is hugely influential and helped so many cis women learn about goddesses and see themselves as divine and to honor those bodies as holy. And I think that's really important because still today, vaginas and menstruation and female desire are all seen as dirty or profane or less than in so many contexts. So I'm grateful for the intention and language and rituals of Dianic Wicca. And yet, as we've discussed on earlier podcasts, Z adamantly excluded cisgendered men and, yup, trans folks across the spectrum from the movement. And unfortunately, she still stands by that today and has used transphobic language in public pretty recently. And all I can say about that is... I find that stance to be hugely disappointing and shameful and, at its worst, harmful. Luckily, there are many of us who have much more open minds and expansive views about the Divine Feminine, and you'll hear me and today's guest discussing this very thing during our conversation. And remember, spirituality is always evolving, and we get to define it and restructure it as we go. So you can take some of the principles and intentions and rituals of Dianic Wicca, for example, and disregard the problematic, transphobic, gender essentialist parts of it and adapt it, as many of us have, into forms that are much more open-hearted and that see the Divine Feminine as transcendent of any kind of sex and that all different bodies and identities can embody it. So practically speaking, to answer your question, you can start certainly by listening to the episodes with many of my prior guests, such as Ilva Mara, who is trans and runs the Cunning Crow Shop in the Pacific Northwest. They also have a wonderful new book out called A Practical Guide for Witches, and they lead all kinds of rituals and practices that you can learn from. Other episodes that are relevant to the topic of queer and or trans witchery include my conversations with Rachel Pollock, Brooklyn, Edgar Fabian Frias, Jinx Monsoon. Um, those are the ones that are coming to mind, but there are many other queer or trans witches who have been on this show. So start by following them on Instagram and seeing what rituals or art they're creating and what communities they're associated with, what books they're writing, and that is surely going to lead you down some of the paths that you are looking for. You can also follow or reach out to intersectional feminist witch shops and see if they can recommend any circles or classes or workshops that are LGBTQ plus friendly. I know, for example, House Witch in Salem wears its queerness and intersectional feminism on its sleeve very proudly. And come to think of it, you might want to check out my conversation with its owner, Erica Feldman, as well. The Brooklyn shop Cult Party isn't a storefront anymore, but it still has a great online presence and happens to be owned by my fabulous friend, Debbie. There's also a shop called The Future in Minneapolis, which is truly tremendous. 
And then there's the Modern Witches Confluence, which is an annual conference in San Francisco that definitely welcomes all stripes of witchery as well. So you can see which witches and vendors are involved with them too. And like lots of us, they have taken their activities online in this strange year. So there's all kinds of things that you can be exposed to and discover through them. In sum, it's been really exciting to see the modern witchcraft movement become more expansive. But let's be honest, the archetype of the witch is relevant to anyone who has been disenfranchised, whether due to their gender or religion or nationality or skin color or other physicalities. As I write in my book, magic is made in the margins. And I truly believe that witchcraft is here for anyone who has ever felt other or under or less than. And I'm so happy to see that there are so many in the witchcraft community who feel the same way. So good luck and let me know what you find. Now on to my guest. Sarah Faith Godesdiener is an artist, author, and business owner who wrote the cult classic workbooks Many Moons from 2015 to 2018 and now creates the Many Moons Lunar Planners, which are beloved and so splendid. She has sold over 80,000 copies of her limited edition publications completely independent of any traditional publisher, which is so awesome and such a huge accomplishment. And this was almost entirely through word of mouth. In addition, Sarah has created art, design, and apparel that has been seen in movies, television shows. I just spotted one of her posters in the show Shrill, which I was so happy to see, as well as on the bodies of many magical babes and for brands that, according to her, you have absolutely heard of. (laughs) Since 2012, Sarah has also worked as a psychic tarot reader, reading for nearly 1,000 clients. She is a teacher of the spiritual, the creative, and the magical, teaching classes on energy, the elements, magic, and more. She also has a brand new podcast called Moon Beaming, which I was just a guest on, and I had such a wonderful time, so you can go ahead and give that a listen. Her brand new book, The Moon Book, Lunar Magic to Change Your Life, is out next week. And I have to tell you, this is truly one of my favorite magical books that has come out in years. I absolutely adore it, and I think you're all going to love it too. I am so delighted that Sarah was able to join me to talk all about moon magic, but... As happens often on The Witch Wave, she and I had so much else to discuss that there is a second part to this interview that you can listen to next week via The Witch Wave Patreon. But now, without further ado, here's my conversation with Sarah Faith Godestiner about lunar devotion, rituals, and witchcraft practices. Sarah joined me from her home in LA via Zoom. Sarah Faith Goddess Diener, welcome to the Witch Wave. Hi, Pam. It is so awesome to be here with you. It is so nice to be here with you, too. I wish we could be doing this in person, but this is the next best thing. Thanks so much for being here. I cannot wait to connect with you, and I'm so curious about what you're going to ask me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, first, I'm going to ask you what I've kind of been asking everyone, which is just in this wild time, how are you? How have you been doing? How are you doing today? I know that's a loaded question, but I always like to check in with people. Yeah, I'm doing very well. I feel very grateful to have my health. 
and to be alive, like not to sound too intense, but I feel very grateful for that. I think we've all been speaking about this pandemic related topic, which is that the emotions sort of come in waves, right? So maybe one week we'll be in a grief week or one week we'll be in an anger week, or maybe it's everything all wrapped up into one. If I'm being really honest, which I will be very honest, I have sailed through the rage, the grief, the exhaustion, all of the things. And I'm just really at this point where I'm here to realign my energy and to spend some time focusing on creating new worlds, focusing on the kind of energy that I would like to be in more often than not. I feel like a lot of the last four years, but if I'm being honest, like a lot of my life has been subjected to the whims of other people who don't care about me. And I'm really kind of like having this real like concentrated reckoning of being like, you don't get to define how I feel. I get to define how I feel. And that's not to say that I might feel exhausted and full of rage and sad. I want to fully step into those feelings, not as a reaction, but as like my own compass and my own point of view. So I know that's a very long winded answer to how are you feeling? But today I'm quite well. I feel very grateful to be alive and I feel grateful to be here with you now. Well, I actually think that's a beautiful answer. And first of all, I'm so happy to hear that. And a big fuck yes to you living to your own standards and drawing your own boundaries. But I also think your answers are a great immediate segue to this new project that you are launching into the world. This is your book, The Moon Book. And this book, first of all, Sarah, (laughs) I love it so much. And I don't say that lightly. I truly have found such magic and inspiration and a lot of information. You really taught me a lot of things that I didn't know in the reading of this book. So first of all, big congratulations to you. But the moon and the moon's magic is so much about riding those waves. It's about the ebb and the flow, the waxing, the waning. As you write so beautifully, you know, the moon is so connected to emotion and intuition. So I think this book has come out at a perfect time. And I wanted to know what made you write this book in the first place. Well, first, I just want to say it really means a lot coming from you. And I'm not just saying that you're an artist and you're a writer and you interact with a lot of different people and you're a public person and you just never really know where your work is going to land with people. And I just feel honored that you resonated with it. So first, I just want to say thank you. And I'm grateful. And you are one of the very first people to read the book. So I'm at this point where the book hasn't come out. No one's really read it other than my editors and a few folks that I asked to endorse it, yourself included. I don't know if you ever have this feeling like, I'm like, is this even any good? (laughs) It was so in my head. I was like, is this? I don't know. The book came about through a very, very, very long process In 2012, I started teaching classes on the subject. In 2015, I got the message from spirit, my intuition, the moon, whatever you want to call it, to write channeled workbooks for working and collaborating with the lunar phases in real time. I wrote six of those books in three years. This is your many moons lunar planners that you're referring to, correct? I'm actually referring to many moons workbooks. So first they were workbooks. I did six of them Mm. in three years. The project was from the beginning. The download was that I was just going to do this for three years. They ended up being quite successful in a cult classic kind of way. Mm -hmm. And I was still, you know, teaching and doing other things. Then 
I had a check in in the last year of the many moons workbooks and two things actually happened in that year. One was I finally signed a contract to write this book that was in 2018. And the other was you can continue on with this project, but it makes sense for it to change into a lunar planner. And it makes sense for you to involve many more people, like many more contributors. So that's sort of how the project has morphed and flown. You know, when I got the message to create these workbooks, I had no idea why. I just took marching orders from Spirit. Mm -hmm. And over the course of those three years, I had several offers to turn them into a book. And then I think it was actually my third offer made the most sense for me to go with. And I ended up signing a contract right as the final Many Moons workbook was out into the world. And then for the last two years, I've been in a process of writing and editing the book. And I wanted it to be an evergreen project. And I wanted it to combine everything I've learned through the process of this. I don't know, I started working with the moon in 2007 ish. And then I started teaching in 2012. And then I started teaching longer online classes in 2017. You know, I've taught thousands of people about this subject. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to speak to various folks. There's like 9 trillion books about the moon. It was sort of like, why do I even need to do this? So I wanted it to speak to a number of different people. I wanted it to be pragmatic and magical. I wanted it to be a beautiful archive of the work I spent the last five years plus doing. And I wanted it to provide a framework for not just thinking about the moon, but what above all the moon has given me is a philosophy and a framework for living, which is about magic, intuition, our natural cycles, which is about delivering us back to ourselves as we were meant to be and as we were meant to be experienced. So mm. I really hope that anyone reading the book can understand that this is like a framework we can apply in our lives that goes our creative processes, our healing journeys, our, you know, recovery journeys, our intuitive, like connections, all of these things. It's about a framework of care. It's a framework of totality. It's a framework of processes. And it's a framework that acknowledges our natural rhythms and wants us to accept who we are, how we are, in order to step into our power and our magic. Yes. Ah, oh, Sarah, so gorgeous. And what I love about this book so much, because you're right, I've read a lot of books on lunar magic and on the art of the moon, the history of the moon, the science of the moon. You manage to kind of weave together all of those different aspects and you are a beautiful writer. I mean, the words are pure poetry and really shimmer on the page. And I found myself getting like choked up and touched and swooning over a lot of the passages in the book. And I am a researcher. I'm a huge nerd. I really appreciate not only the fact that you give us real practical techniques, there are lots of spells in here. There's lots of journal prompts and tarot spreads and things like that that people can do. But you contextualize it with so much history and folklore and science. And it just is really rigorously researched and crafted in a way that I have the utmost respect for. So big bravo or brava, I should say. And can you talk a little bit about the research process that went into this book? Because I mean, you are name checking so many different myths. You are name checking so much 
physical properties of the moon and sharing factoids and trivia about it. I mean, all of this stuff that was new to me. So how did you approach this vast, seemingly infinite topic? I, too, am a major nerd. (laughs) I feel like we talked about this. This has nothing to do with the fact we're both nerds, but I think we both have like, do you have any Gemini in your chart? Do you know? Yes, I'm Gemini rising, baby. Okay, so I'm a Gemini moon and I'm like, what's this? What's this? What's over there? What's over? You know, I'm like (laughs) questioning, questioning. I'm like, why is this this way? Why do people think this way? Like, I love history. I love myth. I love science. I love all of the things and I'm constantly questioning. And the first thing that I'll say is what I was really grappling with, with writing the book was the history of something like the moon is like the history of humanity because it's a global phenomenon. Cultures all throughout the world, for as long as we had ways that we communicated with markings, for as long as humans created ritual, they were utilizing and collaborating and noticing the moon. So it had this like really, 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 really complex ancient accumulation. And honestly, that's, in my opinion, where it gets so much of its power. So we all have this relationship with the moon. So I was trying to contextualize it in terms of that. And also, I think that it's really important to give readers portals into other ways of viewing the thing. Like there's this really well-known Buddhist proverb, which is like, don't confuse the moon for the finger pointing at the moon. Mm -hmm. So I did do a lot of finger pointing with all of the research, but I, I wanted to sort of not to be super metaphorical, but the moon, as we know, reflects. So I also wanted the book to be this archive of how humans reflect upon themselves, magic, nature, history, mythology, all of the things that we sort of discuss in the book. So that was sort of my framework. And also like being a nerd, the problem is I just find so much fascinating in general. So it was really difficult. Like the book was double the length, embarrassingly enough, like the first draft of it. So I had to do a ton of editing. And so I was just trying to make it something that a number of different folks could relate to and enjoy. And I wanted to offer up portals into other ways of engaging with this topic and with this symbol and with this symbolic potent, loaded, magical companion that we're so lucky to gaze upon almost every night. Beautiful. And on that note, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Look, it's hard enough grappling with our own emotions under ordinary circumstances, but even more so when the world is going through massive collective challenges. I am so grateful for my therapist, and even though I've done sessions in person for years, I've been pretty amazed at how effective online therapy has been for me right now. And so I can heartily recommend BetterHelp, an online counseling service which can provide you with your own licensed professional therapist to talk to via video or phone sessions. So if you have anxiety issues like I do, or are dealing with depression, stress, trauma, grief, or even just day-to-day struggles with your relationships or your family, or just feeling like you're not meeting your personal goals right now, which let's be honest, has been very difficult for most of us these days, I really encourage you to reach out to the folks at BetterHelp. They will connect you with a counselor that you can start chatting with in under 24 hours. Now, a few things I really appreciate about BetterHelp is that it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, plus they offer financial aid to those who qualify, and they make it super easy to change counselors so you can find one that you really click with. 
Best of all, Witch Wave listeners, that's you, get 10% off your first month of counseling by going to betterhelp.com slash witchwave. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash witchwave. I believe that all human beings can benefit from therapy. I certainly have myself, and I'm so glad that it's becoming more accepted and more accessible to do so. So please pop over to betterhelp.com slash witchwave and find a great counselor to talk to. BetterHelp is confidential, convenient care, and you, my friend, deserve that. I'm a big believer in stars aligning. And that is why when a product is both exquisitely made and is beautiful and has deep magic and is created by wonderful people, it makes me so freaking happy. And for those of you who've listened to this podcast for a long time, you know that I swoon about Mithras candles. I mean, people will literally contact me or come up to me and talk to me, not just about the podcast, but about these Mithras candle ads, because (laughs) it is so obvious that I am deeply in love with this company. I love Ben and Sochi, who create these candles by hand in Philadelphia. And I freaking love these candles. What can I say? I can't get enough of them. They are 100% pure East Coast beeswax. They have a gorgeous Byzantine drip style and a scent like Apian Paradise. And I kid you not, as I'm talking about these candles, my cat Monday just came over and sat on my lap where he's purring up a storm Um, I think he can sense that I'm just like given the best vibes out right now talking about these candles because they truly make me happy. Here's Monday purring right now. Now, because I love the folks at Mithras and because I love these candles, it has been so wonderful to see this business expand over the years. And Mithras candles now come in both natural gold and their gorgeous new black line made with a plant-based dye. Mithras candles are ancestral lighting for your body, mind, and spirit. And um, guys, I don't even know what else to say. They're the freaking best. I give these candles as gifts. I gift them to myself. They are truly, truly special. So go on ahead to MithrasCandle.com. That's M as in Monday, I-T-H-R-A-S, Candle.com. And use offer code WITCH for 13% off your first order. That's MithrasCandle.com, offer code WITCH for 13% off your first order. I promise if you get these candles, you're going to be purring too. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today, I'm speaking with Sarah Faith Goddess Diener. So, Sarah, we're talking about your exquisite new book, The Moon Book, and you touch on gender in this book in a way that I so appreciate because you really draw the line between gender expression and expressions of femininity and masculinity. You have this really wonderful quote, on the vast canvas of our evening sky, the moon is the closest symbol to us of the divine feminine. We can utilize the moon to examine what the feminine encompasses and how this can be expanded upon and evolved. And then you later go on to say, the moon's pronouns are whatever you choose. The moon isn't picky or attached like that. There have been feminine moon goddesses and masculine moon gods and larger lunar energies that exist beyond gender. The moon is for all genders, trans, cis, non-binary, or however else one chooses to identify. And I love that you are so thoughtful about just parsing out the difference between divine feminine energy and let's call it womanhood or 
that real troubling and limiting binary of thinking, you know, that old Marge Piercy quote, the moon is always female. And I love that book. I love Marge Piercy poetry. But I think we've evolved past that to have this understanding of the moon as not female or male, but rather feminine. So I I would love for you to expand on that a little bit. No deities, no planets, in my experience, are limited to one gender. Gender goes beyond language. We know that since the dawn of time, there have been any number of genders in the world, any number of genders that people experience. And we also know that at least in more modern day, and I can only speak to my limited knowledge base, which is that of mostly European history and United States history, We know that gender is constructed to reflect systems and capitalism. And it's really, in my humble opinion, to flatten us. Mm. We know that you or me or, you know, the bird on the wing or my dog or whatever, they're way beyond a gender identity. And that's not to say that if you identify as a man and you love that, or you identify as a woman and you love that and you have specific ideas about what that means for you, that's great. I'm so glad. I think that in my experience of studying religion and studying philosophy and studying the occult and witchcraft, there is a part of that which we create stories that reflect how we want to see the world through myth and through religion and through magic. And some of the more limiting ideas around who was allowed to tell stories about gender it reflects their viewpoint, similar to how the Constitution reflected who was writing it at the time. Sure. In my humble experience of working with the divine, the divine femme, the divine feminine, the divine masculine, the divine intersex, It's very holographic, it's very expansive, and it's also uniquely personal to the person exploring it. And in my research, I really do understand the connection in specific pagan or European-derived magical practices to connect the moon with, I'm putting this in quotes, femininity because of the connection between periods and the moon. Now, not everyone who gets their period is a woman Mm -hmm. and not every woman has a period. I've had many clients come to me and say like, I'm so glad you're saying this. Plenty of people who have attended my workshops, my lunar workshops, who identify all over the spectrum of gender, because of course it is a spectrum, it is not a binary, who have a very intimate relationship with the moon that has nothing to do with their gender or their body or whatever else. So I guess this is a very long-winded way of saying that I do believe that we need to be mindful. I'm speaking as a cis person. We need to be mindful of assigning gender essentialism in our magical practices, spiritual practices, and in our life. I would love to hear your comments on that. Yes. Okay. I am nodding vigorously. You can't see that right now. And I'll just say, you know, this is something I really grappled with. And I don't want to talk too much about my work because the spotlight's on you, baby. But 
I really grappled with this and continue to grapple with this as I write about the archetype of the witch, because on the one hand, I think that the witch and the moon, and you write so beautifully about witches and the moon in your book, but they are associated with women and associated with femininity. And there's a history of patriarchal oppression that has also, I think, made it important for us to honor the moon and honor witches and witchcraft and menstruation and all these things that have been so maligned or considered mysterious in maybe a threatening way or lesser than. You know, so often the moon is talked about as reflective and passive, whereas the sun is the really important, powerful entity. So I think it's important that we do course correction. And I think honoring goddesses and honoring the feminine or female experience is really important, while at the same time, acknowledging that we are evolving past these binaries and that anybody can be a witch. Anyone can have access to lunar power. And I think it's important that we honor menstruation, but not to then exclude anybody who doesn't menstruate as therefore not having access to this divine feminine power. So for me, it's like very much a both and Yes. And that's hard. It's really hard to talk about. It's hard to put language around. But I think you do it so, so beautifully throughout the book. And I just really wanted to highlight that for people, especially people who might sometimes be turned off by phrases like goddess worship or the divine feminine, because, you know, they they like their magic to be transcendent of those boxes. And, and your book really transcends that in a beautiful way. So well, well done. Very well done. I mean, I agree with exactly everything you're saying. And if someone's exploration of their menstruation cycle and lunar magic is what makes them come alive, is what really puts puzzle pieces together for them. And that's how they want to experience lunar energy. I'm all here for it. What I'm not here for is gatekeeping or assigning hierarchies or absolutes to natural energies that every single person, every single animal, every single plant can collaborate with and experience. That's kind of the long and short of it. Yes, I love that. And I I do love that you've also talked about male lunar deities. I mean, we just got two kittens and Mm. they're both boys. And one of them is named Monday. And I named him Monday Uh. because he's silver and soft and it's the day of the moon and they were born on a Monday and we homed them on a Monday and it just seemed like his name, right? But he he's a little I boy. Love that. Yeah. Who I mean, who knows how he or they identify. <laughs> right. but. We don't right, exactly. Yes. i I have a dog that everyone thinks is a boy dog, but she's a girl dog. And once I had this client come over and the client was like, Oh, he's so cute or whatever. And I said, Well, it's a she. And then I like stopped myself and I was like, who literally cares? I said <laughs> Well, you can call her whatever she wants, unless she wants to be called something else, in which case we'll respect that. But, you know, yeah, it's like Monday, the cat is the cutest little thing I've ever heard of. I love that. He's really special. And in researching his name and researching the history of how we name the seven days of the week and why we name the day Monday, I learned about the Norse god. And I might mispronounce Mm -hmm. this god's name. I believe it is Mani. And Mani is the male Norse god of the moon, and his Mm -hmm. sister is Sol, the female Norse goddess of the sun. And Mm -hmm. so I just love that you remind people too. And I know I'm belaboring the point here, but I think it's an important one that there are lunar deities across the gender spectrum. And I just, I'm so happy that you highlighted that too. On that note, we're going to take another quick break and we'll be right back. It has been a long and stressful year. 
Are you ready to steep yourself in some healing? I know I am. Seasonal Steep is an experience experiential subscription box that honors the wheel of the year with a potent combination of herbal medicine, astrology, and tarot. Part tea ceremony, part ritual, and part online class, Seasonal Steep helps you create a space for discovery and learning through a transformative experience that unites body and mind. And here's how it works. Four times a year, Seasonal Steep subscribers receive a beautifully curated box designed to honor the season and strengthen you on your journey. Each box includes tea that features a seasonal herb, two reusable tea bags, a silk altar cloth that can also be used as a mask, and admission to an interdisciplinary online class in which you'll learn about each herb alongside an exploration of planetary and tarot archetypes. Are you looking to build a better relationship with plants? Your Seasonal Steep subscription connects you to your body and the natural world to create harmony and healing. You'll also be contributing to an important organization aligned with our values. This winter's Seasonal Steep Box honors water and our earth by donating 10% of the proceeds to Charity Water. Join us this year as Seasonal Steep deep dives into burdock, dandelion, yarrow, and rose. Ooh, that sounds lovely. Subscription details are available at SeasonalSteep.com. That's Seasonal, S as in Sorcery, T-E-E-P dot com. And you can find them on Instagram at Seasonal Steep. And you can use promo code WITCHWAVE for 10% off your subscription. So go on ahead to SeasonalSteep.com and use code WITCHWAVE for 10% off. Ah, I feel more relaxed already. I am obsessed with Zoo's incense, which is why I am so excited to announce that I have partnered with them on an exclusive Witch Wave incense blend just for you. The Witch Wave blend is inspired by Artemis, goddess of the moon, the hunt, the wild. It contains sandalwood, orris root, myrrh, black storax, mugwort, ambrette seed tincture, and organic ylang-ylang essential oil. And I cannot tell you how fun and magical it was to collaborate with the folks from zoos and come up with this blend for you. You can order your Witch Wave incense blend by going to witchwavepodcast.com slash shop and you'll see it there. And this is a small batch limited edition, so we'll see how long it lasts. I also want to encourage you to go to Zeus's site and order their incense from them directly because they are so incredible. They have nine incense blends currently available and they are handmade and hand rolled, all natural, and all of their ingredients are organic or wild crafted and made with whole plants, seeds, roots, woods, tree resins, and tinctures. Zoos also offers hand cast, concrete burners, charcoal, raw aromatics like frankincense and myrrh, and incense supplies. Check it all out at zoosincense.com. And if you use promo code WITCHWAVE, you'll get 10% off. So that's right, you've got two places to go. One is witchwavepodcast.com slash shop to get our exclusive Artemis-inspired Witch Wave incense blend. And you can get everything else over at zoosincense.com. That's Z-O-U-Z incense.com. And use offer code witchwave for 10% off everything else. Thank you, Zoos. 
Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today, I'm speaking with Sarah Faith Goddess Diener. So, Sarah, we are recording this episode during a waxing crescent moon. It will be coming out during a waning crescent moon. And one of the things I so appreciate about this book is that you really teach the reader how to work with the various energies and different phases of lunar energy that occur in this magnificent sky through the moon. So can you talk a little bit about working with lunar magic and kind of working through a moon cycle for people who might not be experienced with that? I would love to. There are 9 million different ways to work with the moon. I try to cover some of them. I think for anyone just beginning a practice or even just someone who needs a little bit of magical zhuzhing, so to speak. (laughs) I think that it's always really useful to come back to what's happening with your energy and correlating that with whatever phase the moon is in. Because we go through our own life cycles. We might be in a new moon phase in our life. We might be beginning a new project we're really excited about or beginning a new relationship we're really excited about or feeling ready to express an aspect of ourselves that maybe we haven't before. Or we might be in dark moon energy or waning moon energy where we need to rest more, we need to be more still, we might need to be drawn inward and reflect or connect to our intuition while wrapping up loose ends. Now, if you take the time to notice how you generally feel around phases of the moon, those little descriptors that I threw out, which are more traditionally like European-based magical descriptors, you might feel like your experience of illumination is very different. You might feel that at a new moon or during a waxing crescent, you are exhausted. You don't want to talk to anyone. You're just getting by. You might feel at a last quarter moon, totally ready to take on the world or totally ready to launch a project or network or whatever. So it's really important to sort of figure out your own unique energetic patterns or a few times during the course of illumination where you feel maybe sort of low or you feel kind of more energized and so on and so forth, because then you can plan accordingly. And that also marks someone's intimate relationship with the moon, which is all I'm trying to get people to do here is to have an intimate relationship with your own patterns, your own cycles, your own intuition, your own magic. You know, in the book, I go into five major phases of the moon. Is it five? I do new, waxing, full, waning, dark. Yeah, five. Of course, there are more and I kind of go into those. So it goes over how someone can work with each phase practically, magically, and energetically. The way that I teach and the way that I present my courses is that if we want to create transformation from the inside out, if we are interested in having magical results that are incredibly potent, then we work with one lunation from beginning to end. Doesn't matter where we begin, but You could jump in at the full moon. You could jump in at the new moon. Does not have to start at a new moon. I'm not rigid like that. You could jump in when you feel the best. And if you feel the best at a waning moon, that's when you're going to jump in like a hopscotch. Mm. But we work around a whole lunation with one goal, theme, or intention. 
And that gives us a 360 spiralic perspective and process into creating magic that is sustainable, potent, and transformative. That is what brought me to do this work. It is what I discovered in my own process. I don't teach like, oh, you just light a candle at the new moon and then like, how gone, take me away. We're done. We're through. This is like a process that includes excavation and surrender and experimentation with different kinds of ritual and magic and clearing and practical steps and reflection and thinking about our blocks and subconscious programming. And I could be here all day. So we're working with levels of the consciousness, levels of energy around one specific theme, goal, desire, or dream in order to get results the likes of which I've never seen. And so we can't do that without interacting holistically with an entire lunar phase. Yeah. And I think it's important for people who might be like really confused or might just be <laughs> starting out in their practice for us to even define. And I know you said it, it can vary, you know, from person to person, but broadly speaking, we're kind of talking about sympathetic magic here. It's this idea that we work with a symbol in metaphorical ways that make us feel connected to that symbol's energy. And when it comes to lunar magic, the way I have always approached it is like, okay, if we're trying to grow something, manifest something, you know, generate more energy, that tends to happen during the waxing cycle when the moon herself or themselves is growing and it looks like reflecting more and more light. And then the waning cycle tends to be a time that I do my magic around, you know, more inward work, also trying to banish things or let go of things or, you know, diminish certain effects that something might have in my life that aren't serving me anymore. And my teacher, Robin, taught me, like, if you hold your hands up, that you can tell what phase mm. the moon is in. Because if you make like a C with your left hand and your right hand kind of looks like a D, that stands for caring and daring. So the C uh, is like a, yeah, isn't that lovely? It's like, that's usually how the moon looks when it's waning. And so that's a time to care for yourself. Mm -hmm. Whereas D for daring is a time when you're being more bold and you're manifesting things and being more adventurous. Like this is very broad strokes. I love it. But hopefully that can help listeners too. What I have found in my experience is if, say, you start at the waxing moon and you want to grow something, you want to grow a project you're working on or grow a podcast you're creating or whatever it may be, there's this resistance or maybe block that in general, if we're working outside of our comfort zone, and when we are creating magic, we generally are creating outside of our comfort zone. We have to deal with the flip side of whatever ends up surfacing on the subconscious level once we have decided, hey, I'm going to go for this thing. I'm going to try it out, throw a hat in the ring. I'm going to stake my claim to wanting this desire. There inevitably is, in general, a kind of backlash of doubt or of fear that will happen because it's completely normal because we're humans trying to protect ourselves. So the waning moon, if we work a cycle, if we collaborate with the moon through one whole cycle, we get to address that. And in doing so, we get to reprogram ourselves completely, you know? So yes. it's like, I sort of use the metaphor of like, if you want to be a smart magician, Maybe you don't cast a spell to make rent next month. I mean, maybe you do because you really do need to make rent. Maybe what would be a smarter spell would be your rent being paid easily for the next three years or whatever, you know, like, or mm -hmm. forever or whatever that is. I'm interested in sustainable magic. I'm interested in transformation from the inside out. I'm interested in 
changing our narratives and our stories that we've been programmed with, many of which are not even ours to carry anymore. So if we're going to be looking at the actions we take, the intention we have, the mindset we need to have, the helpers we're calling in, whether they be deities or herbal allies or other planets or tarot cards or our coven or our community, whatever that may be, we also need to look at the doubt, the subconscious programming, the fear. Maybe that also means some ancestral stories. We've come here in this lifetime to heal. That's my take. And I want to be really clear. This is not work that one is doing every lunar cycle. This is a lot, but it is work that one could do if one feels really prepared and ready to make change in their lives and is just excited to see what kind of delightful surprises will pop up as a result of investing in a collaborative relationship with one's own energy and with an energy from the cosmos. Well, I just have to say, you know, I've had, I'll call it a pretty strong lunar practice for a long time. But after reading your book, there is so much that I've learned from you that I can't wait to incorporate into my own magic. I know many, many other listeners are going to feel the same way. So I don't say this lightly. I really encourage everybody to check out the Moon Book. It's incredibly special. I'm going to be recommending it to my friends and baby witches and seasoned witches and everybody in between. It's really, really fabulous. Big, big congratulations. And thank you for it, Sarah. Thank you so much, Pam. I appreciate you so much. We're coming up on time And I know you and I have a lot more to talk about in terms of your artistic practice. So I hope you'll hang around and we can do some extra conversation for our Patreon listeners. But before we go, I do want to just let people know that you are an incredible visual artist. You know, I first fell in love with your work through a poster that I saw in a store called Other Wild here in New York City. It's a poster where you printed out the moon is feminist art. And instead of the word moon, it's just an image of the moon. And I was like, this is so rad. Who made this? And I like Googled the shit out of you and started following you on Instagram. You're such an incredible designer. You have your own line of clothing and other goods called Modern Women. And you have a really great sense of humor and sensibility that's kind of irreverent and intersectional and super stylish. Another of my favorite items that you've designed, you do these different shirts. They have the phrase famous witches on them. And the shirt that I got, I know you've done different iterations of this, but the one I got has Nancy Downs from The Craft, Octavia Butler, RuPaul, Carolee Schneemann, and Kate Bornstein. And every time I wear this shirt, I get so many compliments as I'm walking down the street, makes people so happy. I feel really powerful in it. So I just wanted to ask you how you came to incorporate design and art and magic and intersectional feminism all together. I I know in, in in three minutes or less, (laughs) all of those things, magic, intersectional feminism, art, music. I'm gay. So like my queer identity, like punk identity, like they all saved my life. So I like to spend time paying back the things that saved my life. And in doing that, hopefully I create magic, more magic. And like similar to the moon, I create a reflection in which other people can kind of see themselves. You know, I believe that art and writing and music and magic are some of the most precious things, you know? So that's what a lot of my energy and intention 
has been around like paying back the things that saved my life when I was like a weirdo 15 year old in Hartford, Connecticut, like didn't know I was gay yet, was like listening to PJ Harvey and looking at Frida Kahlo. And I didn't have the symbology or the language around me to reflect back to me who I could feel myself to be. So a lot of my life has been around that, you know, around like paying back and hopefully paying forward what has really been a series of life rafts for me. So yeah, I feel pretty strongly about it or else I wouldn't have spent so much time doing it. But Mm -hmm. I think that it's really important for us to share what helps us so that other people can be helped by it. And so that's the spirit in which I offer up my work and my designs and a lot of what my creative practice has been for the last, you know, 20 years or whatever. Mm, So, so excellent. And I can relate so hard to what you're saying. I think you and I are roughly around the same age. PJ Harvey is a major (laughs) North Star for me, for example. Mm. And so I just, I think that's another reason I just love your work so much that you are incorporating all these artists and scholars and trailblazers into your magical pantheon right alongside with goddesses and the moon. And that's how it is, in my opinion. So I I just really appreciate you, Sarah. Thanks, Pam. Now, before we go, I know that people are going to want to know how they can see more of your artwork, how they can rock their own famous witch's shirt, get the moon book, (laughs) all of the good stuff. So where can people find you, Sarah? My online shop where I sell a variety of goods. Right now, the main thing we're selling is the 2021 Many Moons Lunar Planner, which is a very fantastic offering for the next year. And we'll be selling a couple of other things. We're slowly like repopulating the store. The site there is modernwomenprojects.com. And I'm on Instagram and my handle is a joke of my last name, Goddess. So it's G-O-T-T-E-S-S-S. And the other ways that folks can connect is the best way actually is my newsletter, which they can sign up for my site. I pour a lot of heart and soul into that every week. And there are tarot spreads and sometimes ritual ideas and other musings. And then I have a podcast called Moonbeaming, which you can subscribe to on all of the things. So those are the ways people can connect with me. And they can also buy my book, The Moon Book. This is it. That's where you could really connect (laughs) with me the most. So yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for your magic, lunar or otherwise. Thank you for sharing your many, many gifts with us. And thank you so much for being on the Witch Wave. I'm in absolute awe of you and I wish you many, many blessings. That's it for the show. Thank you again to Sarah Faith Goddess Diener for sharing her lunar love and artful heart. And be sure to listen to the second part of our conversation next week via the Witch Wave Patreon. Do you have questions, feedback, need some witchly advice, or just want to share something magical that happened to you recently? Drop us an email at witchwavepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you, and you just might make it on the Witch Wire. The Witch Wave is produced, written, and recorded by me. Pam Grossman. This episode was edited by Rachel Jacobs, thank you Rachel, and myself. Our theme music is the song Hand and Eye by Lycanthia. Special thanks go to Matt Freeman, Laura Antal, and Cece Pascal. You can check out information about this and other episodes on our website, and now you can buy Witch Wave merch at witchwavepodcast.com. 
please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and give us lots of sparkly stars. It really does make a difference and helps other people find the show. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WitchWavePod. And you can check out my witch emoji for iPhone by going to witchemoji.com or downloading it in the App Store. Please consider picking up my book, Waking the Witch, which is available everywhere now. And if you want more Witch Wave or you would just like to support the show, please do join us on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash witchwave. Thank you so much for listening. Witches are the future. I'll catch you next time on The Witch Wave.